Hello and welcome to the Album Man. Today we're going to be doing another episode of CDs and vinyl I bought recently for about the months of September, October. I know these aren't quite as regular as they used to be, but for one I just can't quite afford records and CDs as, as much as I used to, to be quite honest. And also time is, is certainly a, a big factor, I have not exactly been very time rich recently. But still, without further ado, let's let's get into this. And let's first start with taking a look at the records, since well there's only two of those, but they are certainly rather cool. The first one is Bob Dylan and the Bands uh, Before the Flood. This was the a uh, recorded live concert when Bob Dylan was of course touring with the band. This was during the 70s, so of course you have like uh, Robbie Robertson on lead guitar, you have Levon Helm on drums. And it's a really interesting and really great Dylan lineup to be quite honest. The set list on this is, is rather fantastic. I mean, you look at something like Side 4, which ends of All Along the Watchtower, Highway 61 Revisited, Like a Rolling Stone, and Blowing in the Wind, with other classics, and even something like The Nights They Drove Old Dixie Down on it, which has always been my favourite song from the band. Yeah, this is, this is quite an enjoyable album. I don't know if it's my favourite Dylan Live album. I think I do prefer stuff like the Bootleg series, I'm live at the... Uh, Royal Albert Hall in 65 and things, but it's certainly enjoyable, an interesting slice of a, a period of Dylan's, certainly that around that tour and the, sort of the Rolling Thunder review tour, not, I'm not as, as familiar with to be quite honest. Next up, an all-time classic and a really cool version of it. This is T-Rex's Electric Warrior, the song that, well, most famously spawned Get It On, Bang A Gong. It also has classics such as Jeepster, Cosmic Dancer, Mambo Sun. It's T-Rex's best record, in my opinion, and just about beats out the slider. And this is actually one of the very, very original presses of it. Um, looking at the label and the matrix codes and things, this seems to be actually the rarest version of it. It was just found in a car boot sale, which is really quite awesome. It's, it's a little bit scratched, a little bit scuffed, but it sounds fantastic, and it's meant to be the best sounding version of the original, though with its age, its, its age certainly does show. On to the CDs then. We have first a 2016 release, Swans the Glowing Man. Now, I've not had the opportunity to talk about Swans too much on this channel. I did talk about To Be Kind, and my favourite albums of 2014, is that? I think so, because it was in my top ten, and is still certainly my favourite Swans album. The Glowing Man, I feel, goes in a slightly different direction, but still keeping that same formula that we've seen with The Seer. Um, and to be kind, a very long song, this is a two disc thing, another two hour thing, but with a lot, I would say, less lyrics, there's a lot more sort of chanting and this more sort of meditative aspect to it, and I saw Swans play live at the Roundhouse in London on what is going generally the, the final tour of their current incarnation, and they're one of the loudest bands I've ever seen, incredibly loud, but a very strong live band, and certainly an experience, very different to I think anything that I've ever seen live before. This album, it's not one of my absolute favourites of the year, but it's certainly one that I do enjoy and needs further listens to really understand. Swan's albums are naturally ones that are going to grow on you. So there's been a fair bit of opeth I've picked up, a fair bit. I went to Damnation Festival in Leeds, which is a wonderful extreme metal festival, if you haven't heard of it, playing where bands like Electric Wizard, Abat, um, Cult of Luna as well, Julie Christmas, um, they were one of the headlines, that was, that was a wonderful show. And yeah, they had a couple of pretty damn cheap Opeth albums that I didn't actually have. So some of the older stuff, the Candlelight era, so I managed to pick up Morning Rise and Orchid. And they're great albums, I, I, I think that still, you know, it's, it's really from still life um, onwards that Opeth really got better, I would say, until you could argue maybe Watershed type era. But this this still has some great tracks on it. I mean you have um, Advent on this, which is one of my favourites from the early era, and uh, also Black Rose and Mortal. I mean that's that's probably their longest track, I mean like 20 odd minutes, and he's an absolute masterpiece. 
Orchid, it's not an album I like as much as others. I, I think it's probably the weakest of their more death metal albums. I prefer My Arms, Your Heart, I would say, just about. But it's still an enjoyable listen. It's, it's always interesting to see how a band evolves. And always interesting to see how they get to you know, their, their more modern points. And speaking of modern points, we have 2016's The Sorceress. I've had a few people ask me for my opinions on The Sorceress. What do I make of it? Well, in short, I feel that it is a stronger album than Heritage. But that's not that much of a surprise if you've heard my views on Heritage. I, I think it's a bit all over the place. And compared to Power Communion, I do just about prefer it. It does have this weird track, what's it called, called The Seventh Sujon, where stuff goes all Indian. I think it's that one where everything goes Indian, which I don't like at all. But then that goes into The Strange Brew, which is this eight minute masterpiece. It reminds me a lot of um, The Moon and this, uh, what was it called? I can't remember it now, but there was, there was a song, oh. Similar to like the Moon Above, Sun Below from the Pale Communion record in that way. I still think overall this manages to refine furthermore the prog stylings with, I would say it's definitely got a bit of a heavier sound than Pale Communion. Overall Pale Communion I always found to just be, I don't know, rather lackluster. The first few listens I really liked it, but it's an album I think rarely return to. I think Sorcerers is going to be one I'll be returning to a lot more. So I'll be interested to see how it holds up over the years. But at the moment, it's an open for album I definitely really enjoy. Next, going into the into the eighties with something very, very, very low production values indeed. It's Venom's Black Metal, a classic in the new wave of British heavy metal scene. Um, I, I would say in that, and of course, one of the bands that helped spawn black metal. I mean, look at the title, it's called Black Metal, and how it has the song count as Baffery, which I presume is where Baffery got their name. Maybe, maybe it wasn't, but it, it sounds like they, they may have done. I really like this, even though uh, a lot of the musicians on this album are kind of not very good. I, I don't rate the drama in the slightest. But Kronos's voice, the general vibe, it's very rough, very raw, but there's a, a brutality about it and there's, there's, something, there's something enjoyable about it. And this is the um, remastered version with bonus tracks and I haven't really listened to the bonus tracks yet so I can't comment on them but they look to mainly be radio sessions. So Next up we have Megadeth's So Far, So Good, So What? And this is the remaster and let's not go into the whole debacle of whether the remasters are good or bad, and how much they remix them and how much they mess them up. At the end of the day, the original production of these albums on CD is horrific. I find them absolutely unlistenable, to be quite honest. So at least these are listenable. I haven't really listened to this album yet, actually. I mean, I've heard Anarchy in the UK before from it, and In My Darkest Hours, my favourite track. Oh, I can't really say that because I haven't heard the whole record, but I love In My Darkest Hour. And Nicky and Nicky, I actually saw them perform that live at Download Festival with weirdly Nicky Six um, from Motley Crue coming on stage. That was that was kind of odd, but yeah, it's it's it only like three quid in uh, CEX, so uh, not too bad. Another record I found at Damnation Festival that I was really happy with because this was only for a fiver. Emperors in the Night Side Eclipse, and this is the nice sort of deluxe version. Really, really nice hardback thing to it. I'm not a massive black metal guy at all, but this is one of the few black metal bands I really do enjoy. Um, uh, it's something, I like my atmospheric black metal, stuff like um, Agalark and Ulva a lot, and Alcest of course. But when it comes to just classic Norwegian black metal, it's never really been my scene. But Into the Nightside Eclipse is one of those albums that are just so damn good that I don't really care, to be honest. They were so young when they recorded this, as well, it's ridiculous. They're only around like 19, 20, about my age. And to record something as just cataclysmic as this, so evil, dark, and brooding in its atmosphere, sublime. Definitely recommend checking this out, even if you're not usually a black metal fan. I wouldn't necessarily start here. If you want to start in black metal, I'd start with the more atmospheric stuff, which combines clean vocals and the black metal vocals. So start with something like Agalock's Mantle album, or Alcest's, um, even their new album, Kodima. Um, next, we have 
something that's, well, many would say this is the first metal record ever. I might disagree. This is Blue Cheers Vincibus Oraptum. Yeah, I've never been great at saying that. And Summertime Baby, Summertime Baby, Summertime Blues, even their cover of the old Eddie Cochran song, many, many call the first ever metal song. I don't think this has quite that refined metal sound that, say, Sabbath would then have, but it's certainly, it's, it's a great album. I would call this more heavy psych. This is far more accurately described as heavy psychedelic blues. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is a really interesting genre, and it's definitely one of the best from the scene, from the late 60s scene, in terms of that heavy psychedelia. It reminds me a lot also of a band like Vanilla Fudge as well, who I'm, who I'm quite the fan of. Yeah, fun album indeed. Then we have, this is a really interesting one. This is called Makina by Y. Now these guys are pretty damn obscure. This artwork with the croissants and things was even admired by Salvador Dali, which is quite kind of fun. They are from Barcelona in Spain and a very early progressive rock band. You could almost call them more, maybe more psychedelia, but I, I would still categorize them as prog with their song Why Part 1 and 2 being a good 24 minutes long. And these guys must have been one of the first, if not the first, prog bands in Spain, which is not a country that's particularly known for its progressive rock. And it's even one of the earliest in the European prog scene coming out in only 1970. A remarkable achievement from an extremely underground band. Iron Maiden, Dance of Death. One of the worst album covers I've ever seen in my life. I mean, just, what is this? I, the, 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 Scor the Scorpions also have an album cover with this type of weird 3D CGI stuff on it, and it's, it's absolutely fucking terrible. But the album isn't terrible, though. This is, I'm just saying about the artwork. It's definitely my least favourite of the um, reunion albums. I think Brave New World, Man of Life and Death, even Final Frontier and certainly Book of Souls are better than this album. But No More Lies is one of the best songs of the reunion era. And also Wildest Dreams, Rainmaker, Passchendaele, really great songs. I do feel it loses a bit of pace with stuff like Age of Innocence, Gates Tomorrow, and uh, even Montsegur. But it's still a consistent album. I, I've always been a big fan of their post-reunion stuff. I've never been one of those who criticise it being too long and overbearing and things. I, I still think they have been writing really interesting tracks. But this is still the weakest. But it's not half as weak as the album artwork would lead you to think. And last, but by certainly no means least, my favourite Liverpudlian band who aren't the Beatles, Anathema, with their album Judgment. This I found quite cheap just in Camden Market, which was fun. This was this is one of the gothic metal albums. You've got to understand with Anathema. They began as a death doom band, very heavy death doom, and now they've transitioned into a well, very atmospheric progressive rock band with even some maybe new age influences and things. And I did recently see them supporting Opeth at uh, Wembley Arena. That was an unbelievable gig. Both Anathema and Opeth were on form, absolutely stunning that day. And this is, I was surprised by how good the sound is. I usually like their metal stuff. I think Eternity is great. I think Alternative 4 is fantastic. But I don't think any of them really hold a candle to their latter material. We're here because we're here. We're the systems. But this, this really, really does. It's an album that seems to be centered around the death of the main brother's um, mother. Um, and you can really feel their sadness, their pain. It's, it's a, it definitely marks a stylistic departure in some ways because the bassist, Duncan Patterson, who is also a key songwriter, had left the band by this point. This is the first album without him. And you can tell because here you have Danny uh, Kavanagh, Kavanagh, I never quite know how to say his name, really taking the reins. Every single song is written by him. I think maybe the odds were written by the drummer, John Douglas. But this has him all over, and this is where you start to see the anathema we have today emerge from the very metal-heavy anathema of old. Highly recommended. So yeah, that's been all the CDs and vinyl that I have bought recently, and overall this has been The Album Man. Thanks for watching, comment, subscribe, and as usual, long live rock and roll.